I uh, first met Chuck Earl Jack when he was uh, a brand new teacher, fresh out of college, English teacher, and I was a nerdy ninth grader in his class. So here we are, 43 years later, yeah. and uh, he's going to give us another class. And I promise I won't fall asleep, <laughs> I won't throw spitballs, and I won't cause trouble. So, uh, uh, Chuck, welcome. And he is going to, his program is American Indians, Native Americans of the Allegheny Valley. Welcome. Thank you, Gary. Thank you all very much for coming out on such a challenging evening. The truth of it is that Gary said, Chuck, we need a speaker for January. Nobody wants to speak in January. <laughs> They're tired from the holidays. The weather's unpredictable. I said, Gary, I, I don't know what you know, I could talk about. He said, it doesn't matter. All you have to do is wear the Oakmont Historical Society sweatshirt and tell everybody that they can buy one for 10 or 20 bucks at the History Center. So there you go, Gary. I, I did the commercial. <laughs> You know, I probably would have worked for another 10 or 15 years had I been permitted to wear sweatshirts to work. I love sweatshirts. They, they just accentuate my sleek, lean, athletic build. <laughs> but I was in Brugger's with this sweatshirt on a few days ago. And we have some pretty bright kids in our school district. And one of the precocious lads came up to me and he said, did you graduate from Oakmont High School? He thought this was an Oakmont High School sweatshirt. And I said, yeah, I did. He said, well, you look pretty good for being from the class of 1889. <laughs> Do we have any persons present who have American Indian or Native American heritage in, in your family? Okay, a couple. You know, I want to say to everyone that I make this presentation with great humility. This has become an avocation of mine. I'm no expert. And you can see right there a lot of people whose ideas I've stolen. And I brought some of the critical texts that I've used. And at the end of the presentation, I also have an extensive bibliography, not in any attempt to uh, impress, but rather to inform should you have an interest of pursuing the topic. Ever since I was a little kid and my dad would drive through Sharpsburg with all of us in the car and we would see the guy as Suda statue, I started wondering who was that guy? Who lived here before quote unquote we did? Now my family on the Croatian and Polish side only came here around 1890. So we're newcomers. You know, the older one gets, you realize that being here for 125 years, you're still a newbie. But I know that there are a lot of uh, people of different European ancestry who've been here for centuries. As I go through the talk tonight, I'm not going to use any notes. I'm going to try to speak from the mind and the heart. And I want to admit at the very beginning, this is an extremely complex topic. And what I mean by that is, we're not dealing with the old Western movies, the good guys and the bad guys. What we're really dealing with is a clash of cultures cultures that existed for millennia. Now before I talk about the 18th century, the 1700s, I just want to ask you to forget about all current day maps and all current day political boundaries and I want you to think geographically. One of the good teachers in my education in social studies once said, everything begins with geography. And that is especially true when we're talking about American Indian cultures. 
They had rivers and streams. They had walking paths and trails. And it was only in the 18th century that they began to get horses, and especially in our area. The Shawnee, some say, came up the Potomac. The Miami came up the Ohio. The Delaware not only came up rivers, but crossed rivers. And of course, the Seneca came down the Allegheny. And so, even though I may, in my remarks, comment on in current western New York, you have to pretend that none of those boundaries exist because they did not exist for the Indians. Gary Rogers and the History Society has done a superb job, and especially during our anniversary year last year, reminding us that Oakmont began with the Haltons. And I was happy that it had snowed the day I went up there because you could see the names better and it dawned on me that I've often heard of John and James Halton, but yeah, there was a Susanna Halton too. And, and I'd like to know more about her. Of course, John Halton, and as the new bridge is being built, the Halton name is right out there. And then down in the cemetery beside St. Irenaeus School, there are the graves of Peter and Michael Bright. And the Bright Farm was actually the first parcel of land in Oakmont. Now, these folks arrived here around 1818. And my talk tonight will essentially take us from 1667, and this will be my only reference to that date, when La Salle, the French explorer, sailed down the Allegheny River and was probably the first European to behold what we call the Allegheny Valley and the forks of the Ohio. Very interesting to me, I get lucky. A friend of mine used to say, I'd rather be lucky than good any day. I've been lucky my whole life. January issue of National Geographic. Archaeologists found a 12,000 year old complete skeleton of a 12 year old girl who fell and perished in a cave. We now have the complete genome of those people. Naya, which is what they named her, would be an ancestor of the people we're going to talk about tonight. I highly recommend that. All kind of fascinating details in that article, but I just wanted to reference it. Down near Avella, <clears throat> there is a National Historic Site called Meadowcroft Rock Shelter or Village. You hear it called by both names. And I'm not going to read the plaque. You can read what's on it. I am grateful to the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission for giving me permission to use these images of some of the markers. But think about this for a minute. The massacre at Wounded Knee occurred in 1890. That used to seem like a long time ago to us. There were people in western Pennsylvania 12,000 to 16,000 years ago. And since our calendar traditionally marks the birth of Jesus as, you know, before and after Christ, before the common era, the common era now, Jesus, he was here just yesterday, 2,000 years ago, compared to the people at Meadowcroft Rock Shelter. That's what you see when you go down there because it's in a hillside. It was a shelter that the hunters would use as they passed through the area. Hunting game. That's what it originally looked like, a cave. And as you read on the plaque, it was only discovered by the man who owns the property in 1973. But James Ottavazio and others 
have done a lot of great archaeologic work. That's what it looks like on the inside. And they have discovered all kind of artifacts and pottery. And it's interesting, among archaeologists, there, were, there was some quarreling and dispute. Was this really as old a site as Ottavazio and others claimed? And it has been verified to be 12,000 to 16,000 years old. So there were people here long before the Europeans. And there are lots of theories, by the way, on how they came. I'm sure you know about the Bering Strait land bridge. But there are also theories about people coming up from Latin America. Even theories about the Polynesians crossing the Pacific. Or other seafaring cultures from Europe crossing the Atlantic. A theory about the Celtic people coming here thousands of years ago. And then you'll see that reflected somewhat here. Where do we get the word Allegheny? Well, there it is. 1000 BC, there were mound builders in the Ohio River Valley. Now, one thing I have to emphasize is we're not sure when the Allegheny was named the Allegheny. The name Ohio comes from the Indian word Ohio. We would spell it O-Y-O. And it means beautiful river. I also read that it could very well mean bloody river because of all the battles that were fought along it. But I'm pretty certain it means beautiful river. The Allegheny built burial mounds and you'll see how that connects to Oakmont. Down in Moundsville, West Virginia, where Tom and Eddie's food products from Oakmont used to have a pizza shop, <laughs> there's one of the great Indian mounds. But it's not the one that's closest to us, as you will see. Of course, what's so fascinating is it's obviously old because Nobody planted those trees last year. Those trees have been growing in there for a long time. So the Alawegi people lived here thousands of years ago and built burial mounds. <clears throat> Everybody's familiar with Boyce Park, established in 1963, named after the man who founded the Boy Scouts of America. That's the Carpenter Log Cabin and before I started reading about American Indians, I thought that was really old. It's from the 1800s. And that's a beautiful reconstruction of it. And there's also an historic, historical society connected with the park over there that has a wealth of information. But here's what I want to emphasize. There was a group of people called the Monongahela people. And one of the other things you run into when you read about all the people who lived here is some archaeologists may give them different names. They'll call them the Erie people, the Monongahela people, the Alawagi, and it takes a smarter person than I to figure out exactly where those lines of demarcation are. But notice they excavated burial mounds in our American bicentennial year. <coughs> And I want to emphasize this. They find 26 burial sites. So they inferred that there must have been a village there. And you'll see where I'm going to connect that. That's what it looks like today. And you know, when I drove over there to take that photo, I searched for some kind of marker about the Monongahela people. I suspect there is one. I didn't find it. But I wanted it to be right along New Texas Road there, right where you turn into the park. Why not? Why not? That's sensational. Most of us have an image of American Indians that comes from the thousands of awesome photographs taken by Edward Curtis. And if you log on to the internet <clears throat> under Northwestern University, put your slash and put Edward Curtis, you can look at every photograph he ever took. Now, Curtis essentially photographed from about 1880 to 1910, 1920, 
somewhere in that range. Some people criticize his photographs. They say they're really not authentic, that they were staged. But they're treasures nonetheless. And he took a lot of photographs of the Plains Indians and the Pueblo and the other Indians in the Southwest. It is believed that the Pueblo are some of the oldest American Indians in the United States. I have this book up here and I'm using it for a couple reasons. First of all, here's what an Indian who lived around here would look like in the summertime. I had to ponder that to realize that was a summertime photo. <laughs> I don't think they dress that way on a weather day like today. But very different from the Plains Indian, and you notice you don't see a horse. Now you see that word, Dea Oga. That's a Seneca word, which means beautiful place of three rivers. And that was the name that the Seneca gave to what we call Pittsburgh, or the Point. And one of the reasons studying American Indians right here in our valley is challenging. This was a crossroads. The Seneca were coming down from what we today call New York State. The Delaware, or Lenny Lenape, had been pushed from Delaware and New Jersey all the way over the Alleghenies, essentially by colonization and the frontiers people. And I always like to emphasize that the Indian name Lenny Lenape means one of two things, the original people or, and I like this one, but I think it's more poetic, human beings. The Western Delaware is the name that refers to the Indians who lived here. And they were a very powerful group. The Shawnee, the name Shawnee means wanderers. The Shawnee moved all over the place, all over the place. And they got along with other tribes. Not all tribes got along with one another, but the Shawnee tried to find a way to do so. Now the Mingo, think of it this way. The American colonists were to the British back in England what the Mingo were to the Seneca. The Seneca up in New York were the mother country, so to speak. Some of the Seneca left there and they came down here to live at what they called the Forks of the Ohio or the Ohio country. And we'll talk more about them. Now I threw these different names up there just to give you a visual. Nuka Kana, Shingas, Tawia, Gayasuda, Tanaka Rice, and Aliquippa. Aliquippa, by the way, is a woman. And I was so thrilled. And I even have a great picture of her thanks to the Heinz History Center. And she was one tough cookie. <clears throat> now the road, or the names down at the bottom, think of uh, counties, towns, and roads that you know of. And there's just about every one of them. And there's about 50 more, all from this era. This is Chuck Ertle Jack's map of the Allegheny coming down the right hand side of the screen and the Ohio heading north before it turns west and then flows southwest. I took the zigzags out. Notice that Katanning originally was called Kitani, means great river. Terenum, I'll talk a little bit about. Old Chartier's Town, a Shawnee village. Lawrenceville, a Seneca village, one of the biggest villages on the Allegheny. Of course, we all know about Fort Pitt. There are a thousand stories I could tell about Fort Pitt, but I won't have time. McKee's Rocks was Shingus Town. Shingus was called the Scourge of the West. He did not like the Europeans. And I saw this quotation attributed to Tamaqua, who's called King Beaver from the Beaver Clan. And I've also seen the same quotation attributed to Nemecolin, who lived down around Uniontown. One of them said, if we give the English 
all the land south of the forks. And we give the French all the land north of the forks, what will be left for the Indians. And here's a delicate point that I have to make. And I wrestle with this in my own heart and conscience. We are all the beneficiaries of what the founding mothers and fathers accomplished here. Whether they came with the Dutch, the Spanish, the English, the French. And we know there are ancestors of all those groups still living here. But no matter how we slice it, this was not our land. And we brought all of our European concepts, which were all legitimate in our culture, like private property, money, treaties, deeds, and we used these with the American Indians. And a lot of times they didn't understand them because they didn't even have the concept or the word in their language. Let me tell one quick story to illustrate that. One of the presidents, late in the 1800s, invited 50 Indian chiefs to Washington, D.C. And they were given a tour and they were taken to the National Gallery of Art, which I presume had to be brand new. And as the story goes, the chiefs came out of the gallery and as the story goes, they said to one another, this is so strange. They think that what is on those pictures is beauty. We are out hunting and we see an awesome scene in nature. That's beauty to us. So even on aesthetic philosophical concepts, you know, there was a difference. I'll talk a little bit about Logstown, uh, not at all really about Sawkunk, which is Manaka, other than it was another village of Shingas. Now, Queen Aliquippa, how fascinating. William Penn loved the Indians. He respected them, he revered them. When he went back to England in about 1701, 1703, I think it was his son Thomas became the colonial governor. He just wasn't kind to the Indians. One of the things he did, the colonists wanted to buy property along the Delaware River. And they made an agreement with the Indians that the Europeans, the British, can have as much land as they can walk in a day. It's called the walking purchase. Well, what the Penn boys did was they sent guys to cut a path and then they got a hold of the three best runners they had. And that's what they did the next day. They ran the cut paths as fast as they could and the Indians never imagined that they were going to claim as much property as they did. Well, here's Queen Aliquippa. And by the way, they call her Queen Aliquippa because they're laying a British concept on native people. She wasn't a queen. She was a chief maker. She was probably the most powerful woman among the Seneca down here in western Pennsylvania. In 1907, she wrote a letter saying there are too many Europeans coming over the Alleghenies, coming into western Pennsylvania. She had very good relations. And by the way, let's, let's remember this because those of us who grew up on the western movies, we were never taught this. Columbus landed in 1492. I just think of that as 1500. Nice round number. The colony of Jamestown, the first colony in America, was founded in 1607, about 100 years later. Hundred years later, Aliquippa is writing her letter to the colonial governor saying, too many Europeans coming over here. For the first 200 years, even 250 years, the American Indians and the Europeans 
got along rather well. And it was the traders and the trappers who became friends with them and the Indians shared their knowledge and their skills and helped the Europeans survive. And the reason I'm focusing on the 1700s is that's when things began to change. Why? Because by 1750, the Indians had been pushed from the Atlantic seaboard in New Jersey and Delaware. And, and I'm talking about the northeastern woodland Indians. There were many, many other tribes in other places. They were pushed over the Delaware River and they were told, cross the Delaware and you can have that land. Then they were pushed over the Susquehanna. Then they were pushed over the Allegheny Mountains. Then they were told by treaty with the King of England Cross the Ohio. You can have everything north and west of the Ohio. Well, we, we know the sad story. I just ordered a book and it's due to arrive on Wednesday and I'm like a kid in a candy shop with books. And the other reason I like it is the author is female. So many books written on this topic are written by men. There is a new book. The author's name is Mary Stockwell. And she's written a book called The Other Trail of Tears. We all know about the forced Indian movement in the 1830s under President Jackson. And the Cherokee who were assimilating were forced to leave anyway. Well, there's a whole story about the Ohio Indians being forced too and that's what Mary Stockwell talks about. Here's the great photo of Aliquippa and I'll tell you one quick story. Or, or this is another historical thing and it talks about, notice in 1753, George Washington, who is returning to Eastern Virginia, knew that he had to stop to pay his respects to Aliquippa. And, and by the way, and I'll throw this in quickly, I love George Washington. He's the founding father. I revere him. I respect him. But you know, he came up here, you know, as a kid, I always thought, well, you know, George Washington came here to bring freedom and liberty and independence and no, no, no. He was sent here by the wealthy influential Virginians who had formed what was called the Ohio Company. And he was a surveyor. And in fact, his older brothers nominated him to come up to the point and go up to Lake Erie to Fort LaBeouf to hand the French commander a letter. And, and back in those days, before they battled one another, they were very polite. The, the letter essentially said, would you please leave the Allegheny River Valley and the forks of the Ohio? And the French commander made Washington wait three days. Then he saw him, then they ate and drank together. And it was that return trip where Washington and Christopher Gist or Geist, Gist I believe is proper pronunciation, made a homemade raft across the Allegheny. George fell in and if it weren't for Christopher we wouldn't have had George Washington to chop down the cherry tree. Somebody else would have done it. But they're making this return trip in the winter and Washington knows that he has to stop to pay his respects. And in Washington's diary when he left the next day after meeting with Aliquippa. He put in his diary, I gave her gifts of blankets and rum. She much preferred the latter. <laughs> <laughs> now, I wanted to tell that quick story for this reason also. I'm not a prohibitionist. I enjoy a good cold one and a good drink like anybody else. But rum was one of the main products that the colonists had to barter with the Indians. They wanted their beaver pelts, their fox furs. These were coveted over on the European market. Well, they had to give the Indians something. And two things we gave them were rum and guns. And originally we gave them guns for hunting. 
And, and there's just something that, that sticks in my soul about that. You're, you're probably aware that the poverty level among American Indian groups today is about 50%. And the alcoholism rate is extremely high also. And, and I have a friend, Father Dan Crosby, who ministered uh, in Lame Deer, Montana for 15 years. And he's the one who taught me it's not that Indians lack industry or initiative or knowledge or education. Their whole world view was turned upside down. And while there are many Indians who according to our standards are successful and have integrated into society, hold jobs in all kind of professions, all kind of artistic endeavors, governmental roles. It's still very hard for many of them. There, there's a very good book called Res Life, R-E-Z. It talks about an Ojibwe reservation over near Lake Michigan. If, if you want a good book on what Indian life is like today, I'd, I'd recommend Res Life. But Al Equipa, she was a tough cookie. She was definitely a tough cookie. Now up in Terenum, that's just a little visual to help you understand where we are now. There was a Shawnee village. The only thing I know about the chief is his name. Unlike the Haltons and the Lees and the Brights, you know, we don't know where the graves are. We don't have gravestones. We don't have markers. But Peter Chartier, I guess we'd call him Chartier, he was half Shawnee and half European. He set up in 17, well, it was a little later in 1728. The Shawnee arrived there and they set up a village. The Europeans came, they built structures like this to protect themselves. This still stands at the mouth of Bull Creek and the Allegheny River up at Terenum. It's a replica. But keep in mind, most Indian camps were along creeks. And remember, the Allegheny River was not the Allegheny River we know. The Kinzua Dam fundamentally changed the nature of the Allegheny River. The Allegheny River used to have rapids. It used to freeze everywhere in the winter. It was very shallow in some parts, deep in others. So you would often find the Indian villages along creeks. And I'm planting the seed for the speculative historical theory that Gary Rogers and I are going to spawn. I'm not going to read this to you, but I want to emphasize that they called this place Alleghenia, for what that's worth. And you'll see at the bottom that Peter Chartier's trading post became the center of the village. Now this testifies to the fact that the Indians and the Europeans were getting along well in the early 1700s. There wasn't that much conflict yet. And the trading posts were one of the places where they really interacted. Uh, a young person asked me a month ago, he said, how did, how were the Indians able to, to speak to the uh, British, the colonists who spoke English? And I said, remember, they had been talking to them for 200 years. So there were a lot of American Indians who, you know, became masterful with English and could converse. So right up there in Terenum, there was a Shawnee Indian village. Now there are two theories on the Shawnee, I'll make this quick. One is they were pushed by the colonists. The other is, and I find this fascinating, a fascinating insight. The Iroquois from New York used the Allegheny and the Susquehanna, the West Branch and North Branch of the Susquehanna, to basically control Pennsylvania. And Route 45 that I used to drive from State College to Lewisburg when I would go back to Bucknell after a break, I just knew it as Route 45. Well, then I discovered it was called the Old Pennsylvania Turnpike. Well, then I discovered it's called the Carandina Path. It was one of the many paths that the Indians used to zigzag across Pennsylvania.
But the Shawnee and the Delaware who lived in the Susquehanna Valley did not like being under the thumb of the Iroquois. So another theory is they came west to get away from the Iroquois. The, the Iroquois laid claim to this also. Lawrenceville, big resurgence, right? We're all excited. It's another one of those historic places in Pittsburgh that's making a big comeback. Well, you know what? It was a big place, an exciting place, long time ago, only it was called Shanapentan. And you can see from this historic marker, there was a trail, there was a trail that started over near Huntington, PA. There was Frankstown Road, there was the Catanning Path, there was the Nemecolon Trail that came up from Uniontown. There was the Venango Path that came down from Erie. There was the Couscous Path that came down from Newcastle. Paths everywhere. But this one came from Raystown, which is over near Huntington. And you see the terminus. I looked that word up. No, Gary, I didn't. <laughs> the, the end point was Shanapentan. And what was happening there? Europeans and Indians getting along, trading goods, you know, doing okay, doing okay. And you saw in the previous slide that uh, that's one of several places where they say Aliquippa lived. You know, I think I read Connellsville, down on the Yakagani, Uniontown. And that's another thing that you have to remember. Indian villages were often comprised of 30, 50, 80, maybe 100 people. And they were families. And it's not the way we live today, where you put down your tap root and you want to stay there and you love your hometown. This whole region <laughs> was home for them. So they could move around. And it didn't bother them. Now I'm just going to mention uh, McKee's Rocks also known as Shingistan, was founded in 1730. And you can see that there's an ancient burial mound there. And it's one of the largest. You can see it goes way back, a couple thousand years. They mentioned the Adena people, the Hopewell people, other names of prehistoric people. And there's a picture of uh, the mound. <coughs> when they built the railroad along the Ohio, we almost lost this burial mound. But some influential people stepped in and said, you can't destroy that. You can't eliminate that. And in my research, I came across a WTAE clip from 2010 where an American Indian went to this site and he conducted a religious ceremony. And many of the skeletal remains that were taken out of here in, I think it was 1896 when they excavated it, he would like them returned. And, and you know, it made perfect sense when he said, if you buried your grandparents somewhere, wouldn't you want their remains to stay where you buried them? Just common sense. Now how about our neighbor Verona? Because we were all Alleghenia. We were all Deaoga. There was no Oakmont, there was no Verona. <clears throat> and you know, it's interesting. As I went around and took these photos of the uh, Tan plaques, what we tend to celebrate, Oakmont's an exception, is early transportation. And here's the amazing rail lines. And it's important to remember that the factories and the rail lines were originally run along the rivers and even the creeks. I suspect, I suspect that's one of the reasons we can't find more Indian remains right around here. But Verona has preserved memory in relief sculpture. Every one of us, when we're coming into Verona, we get stuck in the four car traffic slowdown, and we look at the other side of this, and it's all about the building of Allegheny River Boulevard. Again, Rather be lucky than good. I drove around it one day. My God, there's a relief sculpture. What's it about? Well, this is pretty amazing. 
It shows how we preserve history. Here's a Frenchman named Salaron. In 1749, the French governor of Canada sent him down the Allegheny to plant lead plaques that said on them, we claim this territory for the King of France, Louis XV. And that's what it says under it. And you can see on the close-up that the one Frenchman is holding the plaque. So there's Celeron, looking kind of dapper. There's the guy with the pitchfork. He's going to do the digging. The two other Frenchmen, but here, here's what I love. And it just goes to show you how we tend to preserve history. There's the Seneca Indian. And from the sculpture, you would think that, oh, well, you know, that's, that's great. The Seneca were really excited about the French coming down. Well, the truth of it is, they followed Celeron's entourage. And as soon as Celeron turned the corner, they dug up the plaque and threw it in the river. <laughs> and that's why I think, I think maybe we have one of these. One of these. <clears throat> A little farther up the Allegheny, in Venango County, there's Indian God Rock. And very quickly, I threw this in. It's a little farther north than I wanted to go tonight. There's the Indian God Rock. The description said that Celeron planted one of his plaques there. The other thing that's interesting, and I didn't include, there, there's another slide if you go on to Venango County website that shows the petroglyphs they're called. They're things inscribed on this huge rock. And they come from three, four hundred years ago, and they seem to be from the Algonquin language. So they're probably connected to the Delaware because the Delaware Indians, their language is rooted in the Algonquin language. What's surprising is the Allegheny was Seneca territory. That's Iroquois family language, not Algonquin. So it's fascinating, fascinating. And so, you know, an hour's drive. You can go up and see Indian Rock. I promised the county commissioner who gave me permission to use these photos, there would be thousands of people visiting Indian God Rock after my talk tonight. Here's uh, the Heinz History Center rendering of Tamaqua, and I threw this in for this reason. Tamaqua was Shingus's brother. Shingus was the nasty brother. This was like Jacob and Esau in the Old Testament. Tamaqua tried to get along with people. And you notice the quote. The quote totally stunned me. And it shows the complexity of what was happening in the Allegheny Valley. He was a Delaware. The Delaware wanted the British to build a fort down at the point because they wanted to get rid of the French. Why? Because the Delaware lived up the Allegheny and that's the land the French were claiming. The Iroquois were allies with the British during our Revolutionary War, and, and that cost them quite, quite a bit, as I'll mention a little bit later. But I also like this photo because you really get to see again, you know, what the Native people may have looked like back in that time. Now, Logstown is current-day Ambridge, and Tanaka Rison was a chief there. That's the monument that you can see on the Ohio. And what I want to emphasize here is the part that I had printed in red. Tanaka Rison, who is the chief at Logstown. Logstown was a big, big trading center. Big Indian village with traders, trappers, Indians. There was a big treaty signed there. And notice, Tanaka Rison said, we do not believe that we gave away the land beyond the Allegheny Mountains. And I just thought this was a good illustration. Time after time after time, the Indians would say to the colonial powers or the British, no, we didn't give you that land. I hate to say this because I, I don't want to be stereotypic. I probably already have been far too much. Oftentimes treaty sessions went on for days. There were large quantities of rum shared. The Indians didn't know the sophisticated treaty language. It, it, was, it was not one of the best episodes in our history. 
It's a little bit heartbreaking. Now in Etna, where I was born, somebody once said to me, you mean you're not a native Oakmonter? I said, well, I moved here when I was four and a half. <laughs> but in Etna, at the mouth of uh, Pine Creek in the Allegheny River, there was an industrious, any Irish here tonight? If there are, I'll, I'll be kind and careful. There's a book that I have up here that I'll be talking about briefly called A Colony Sprung from Hell. And I saw Daniel Barr, the author, interviewed on the Pennsylvania Cable Network program called Pennsylvania Books. That is one of the most scholarly books I've read on this whole topic. Well, the interviewer asked Daniel Barr, out of all the people you've learned about in research in this book, who is the most interesting? He said, George Krogan. George Krogan owned 30 acres of property in Verona. He was a land speculator who made sure he became the Indian agent, who engaged in trade. He owned thousands of acres of land, and he always wanted the Indians to prevail who would honor his land claims. He was a, uh, an Irish Dubliner. He helped to build Fort Sherry, which is down the eastern side of the Allegheny Mountains. And I'll mention that in a minute. But he had a big trading post at Etna. So once again, there would have been Indians interacting with colonial people. In Sharpsburg, and you see the canal, the Pennsylvania Canal that runs down the Allegheny River, that's what we celebrate. We celebrate our accomplishments. The statue of Guy Suda that motivated me as a child, a little better view. And by the way, this is a good statue of Guy Suda the hunter. When Guy Suda and Tanaka Rison helped Washington go up to Fort LaBeouf, Guy Suda went as the hunter. He was the hunter. This plaque tells us that some people think he's buried under the northern end of the Highland Park Bridge. He's remembered with a fire company name, a Boy Scout camp, the Allegheny National Forest, and Cuyasutha, which is a great recreational area. But this book right here tells a story about Cuyasutha that our memory hasn't captured. And it's Cuyasutha the warrior. Guy Asuda was a mingo. He had a lot at stake if the Indians were to lose the Ohio country. And the Ohio country started at the point. He was a warrior for at least 12, if not 15 years. So he went from being a hunter and a guide to a warrior to becoming a negotiator and a diplomat. Brady Kreitzer, who's a Robert Morris University professor, who wrote the book Gaia Suda and the Fall of American Indian, believes that Gaia Suda was present when Braddock was killed. That's Braddock on the ground. That's 21-year-old George Washington, who you probably heard the story. He was shot through his clothes and his hat, but not a bullet touched his body. The Indians came to believe that he was protected by a great spirit. There was a big battle. I, I always thought the Grant Street in Pittsburgh was named after Ulysses S. Grant. Oh, you know, it goes to show you. You know, where, where my knowledge base was. No, James Grant was part of John Forbes' uh, colonial regiment of about 6,000. James Grant was one of the Scottish Highlanders. They come down to take Fort Duquesne and the French hear they're coming. French come out to meet them with lots of help from Indians, including Guy Asuda. And the British lost that battle. That's on the county courthouse. Bushy Run, right between Delmont and Greensburg. Huge battle. The Pontiac Rebellion. Pontiac was a chief in Detroit. And I used to think Detroit was like the home of Motown. And that it was really far from Pittsburgh. And, and some of my good friends kid me about that. They say, you know, Chuck, you ought to be a little bit more well-traveled. Gaia Suda and Pontiac were in communication. Gaia Suda was down here. Pontiac's up in Detroit. They led a major Indian rebellion. They 
placed siege on Fort Pitt for six months, but when the Indians were defeated at Bushy Run by Henry Bouquet, the Indians realized they lost. There's what the battlefield looks like today. Probably looked a little bit different then. There's Guy Asuda, the negotiator. From the defeat at Bushy Run for the next 30 years of his life, Guy Asuda traveled extensively from Canada down to Pittsburgh, all over Indian country, trying to help people get along because he realized that was the only solution. <clears throat> now, how about our Oakmont? You know, interestingly, we love the beautiful trees. There's the river, and again, I'm emphasizing a point made earlier. That was an interstate highway for all the Indians I've been talking about. And when you see the beauty of where we live today, why wouldn't the Indians have wanted to live here? There were springs, there were creeks, there was a river, there was abundant game, fish, there was land to be farmed, and remember, the Indians did farm. They had the three sisters, corn, squash, and beans. And, you know, they had great nutritional value. But I'll come back to this at the very end. Oakmont was part of everything that I'm talking about. This is the book by Daniel Barr with the picture by Robert Griffin. And we had the blockhouse, and by the way, 250th anniversary of the Fort Pitt blockhouse last year. Emily Weaver from the Blockhouse uh, Society wrote this book, very good book. That's what Fort Pitt looked like. And by the way, Fort Pitt was the largest British fort in America. It's the largest fort they ever built. And you see the earthen mounds. Well, after they drove out the French, the French actually burned down Fort Duquesne. And I, I love this detail. George Washington was sent by Forbes to go down there and drive out the French. The French heard he was coming. They burned down the fort and left. So Washington rode down with his troops, a hero. And word went back to Virginia. Washington drove, <laughs> drove out the French. You talk about uh, you know, how we sanitize things today. But anyway, the British built first Fort Pitt. And like two months after they built it, there was a huge flood that washed it away. So that's what uh, the final one looked like. Huge earthen mounds. And what I want to emphasize, you see all those houses <laughs> growing up around it? Daniel Barr takes the title of his book, A Colony Sprung from Hell, from Henry Bouquet's Letters and Diaries. And Henry Bouquet, who was pretty impressive, very impressive British officer, he wrote in a letter or a diary that if Satan were going to come from hell and create his kingdom here on earth, it would be the environs outside Fort Pitt. <laughs> he said there was every kind of criminal and deviant <laughs> drinking, uh, all kind of misbehavior. That's a euphemism for those of you who went to Catholic school and can only handle euphemisms, but <laughs> Fort Pitt was just, it was an amazing place originally. It sure isn't the Pittsburgh that we live in today. And by the way, Daniel Barr teaches at Robert Morris also. If you want to read one book, this is the one that you want to read by Brady Kreitzer. My first criteria for every book is that it be thin. <laughs> That book is tremendous, called Fort Pitt, A Frontier History. I strongly recommend it. Robert Griffin, if you're not familiar with his paintings, there's one over there of three Seneca looking down on Fort Pitt. That hung in my office as superintendent for 13 years. And, and people used to come in to meet with me. And I had it, I had it there uh, you know, to start the conversation. And people would say, Chuck, what is that? And those of you who know the history of Riverview, I'd say, well, that's Tranquil, Knapp, and Earl Jack looking down on the Riverview School District <laughs> trying to see where we should go. But Robert Griffin, 
His works are published by Paramount Press. If you want an education in what the Northeast Woodland Indians looked like and what their behavior was, just put, just put Robert Griffin's name into Google. You can spend days admiring his work. Now, if you want to purchase, and I promised uh, Jerry Seymour from Paramount Press that I would do a commercial. I know you want to purchase, so contact Paramount Press. Catanning, big Delaware village. I mentioned Fort Shirley. John Armstrong had a brother. The Delaware Indians would leave Catanning, go down the eastern side of the Alleghenies and attack Fort Shirley and any cabin and frontier settlement. No one was supposed to be settling there. But they did. So Armstrong, this was the first time that the Pennsylvania uh, colonial government would let the Pennsylvania militia take action against the Indians. And Armstrong attacked at three in the morning and the Indians lived in these small log cabins and they shot flaming arrows and, and it was a horrific battle, a horrific battle. Now, I don't want you to think that the Indians were always nice guys either. While Armstrong won the battle, the Indians captured some of his men and they flayed them one layer of skin at a time and then burned them at, stake, at the stake. But here's what you have to remember. This was their home. They were trying to hang on to their home. If you haven't seen this for real, go up to Mount Washington and instead of turning left at the top, turn right. There's James West sculpture point of view. And what I like about this, it just captures everything that was going on here. Whose point of view are you going to accept? And what I like about the sculpture is we clearly see, and this is Guy Asuda by the way, we see his tomahawk, and we see Washington's sword. And so they remind us that, you know, there, there were many battles, many battles to determine the outcome. What's interesting, however, is while this is placed at the beginning of the Ohio River, Washington, or Guy Asuda, was down the Ohio, somewhere between Wheeling and Marietta, with a hunting party. And evening is coming, and they see two large canoes coming down the Ohio. This is October 1770. It's George Washington. What's he doing? Preaching liberty, independence. No, he's surveying. <laughs> because this was one of the places where he and the Ohio Company owned lots of land. Well, even though Guy Asuda had been a warrior, it's 1770 now, Guy Asuda welcomes them, they dine together, and it's the last time the two of them ever met. Not going to dwell on this, but I find this fascinating when I stumbled over it. Chief White Eyes, who was a Delaware Indian in, in Eastern Ohio, he was actually invited to the Continental Congress right before the Revolutionary War to make a plea that the Delaware nation be named the 14th colony in the Ohio country. And once the revolution became inflamed, his opportunity was lost. But just as the Cherokee in Georgia, South Carolina had begun to assimilate, the, the Delaware seemed to have that interest, at least some of them. In New Kensington, Parnassus, there was a Fort Crawford. Why was it there? to protect people and to keep supplies against Indian attacks. William Crawford built it. He was a soldier and a surveyor. Anybody surprised? But what I want to emphasize here is, and, and I apologize for the lack of clarity, but what I like artistically is superimposed or reflected off the uh, plexiglass is us today against the history of what happened. But you can drive over there in Parnassus and see this. During the Revolutionary War, another 
American military leader went into an eastern Ohio, Delaware Indian village. And I'm not good at German, not den Hooten. These Delawares were Christians and they were peaceful. And the other military general annihilated them. Women, children, old people. There's one theory, and this is one of these complex, delicate theories, that there was a huge propaganda campaign to vilify the Indians so that people's consciences could rest. And on this plaque, in the last paragraph, they refer to the Indians as savages. That word was not always used in reference to the Indians until we wanted more and more of their land. And they started defending themselves in their home country. So we called them savages. It's a lot easier to kill a savage than it is a friend. But Crawford was captured up near Sandusky, Ohio. He was a friend of the Indians. And when they captured him, the Indian camp was split. Half of them said, this guy's our friend. Half of them said, yeah, but you know what? Remember, Newton Hutton, they hung him up, they flayed him, they burned him at the stake. And that was simply, I guess we'd call it an eye for an eye. You know, the Indians felt very strongly that if you killed my brother, I have to kill one of your brothers. It's not our ethic. It's not our, at least I hope it's not. But, you know, somebody said to me, uh, you know, the Indians were really, really violent people. And this is someone who has a full-blooded Indian in his great-grandparent line. And we talked about that a little bit. And after the conversation, I was watching the news. And I said, is it something in our human nature? Can't we all be violent at times? Hasn't every culture? I mean, I watch the History Channel a lot. I watch the American Heroes Channel, all the World War II, World War I videos. Let's talk about who can be violent. I, th I think we all have that potential. I like, uh, you know, somebody asked Alexander Solzhenitsyn, a Russian novelist, they said, would you agree that the world can be divided in half between good people and bad people? And he said, yes. And the line would go right down the center of my body. There's a lot, lot to be uh, reflected on there. Fred Kohlberg, colleague uh, at Riverview, used to take kids over to Plum at the Penn Glen oil site. And they were excavating an Indian village right there where Plum meets the Paquitos Creek and then you're into Parnassus, right down there by the fort. A friend of mine, now he's actually a coach, he's a full-blooded Iroquois, Sid Jamison at Bucknell. He's also the most successful uh, lacrosse coach in America. He gives talks on Benjamin Franklin's conversations with the Iroquois in putting the Articles of Confederation together. Now, we know that the founders were people of the Enlightenment. They did have the models, the very good models of government from Britain. And, you know, there are even theories that aspects of our government uh, may be modeled after the constitution of uh, the Masonic Lodges. I can't speak with any authority on that. But I mentioned those other three. You know, I'm not saying that the Iroquois created America. but Maybe they had something to do with it. <clears throat> okay, gonna wrap it up here. There's where the wars ended in Ohio country. Tecumseh was an Ohio Shawnee who led a rebellion. He was finally killed. So after Washington had Broadhead and Sullivan go through Iroquois country and burn down every village because they were allies with the British, and after Jefferson signed a Northwest Ordinance, which opened Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Michigan to colonization, 
and after Jackson passed the Indian Removal Act it was pretty bleak pretty bleak for the Indians and so we're back to Oakmont so what do we think what do we think about this borough incorporated in 1889 the year I graduated <laughs> Gary Rogers and I, and I'm, I'm putting Gary on the spot, you know, this is the old argument from authority, which is usually a fallacy of logical thinking, but we do believe strongly that this was rich, rich hunting grounds for the Indians. We also believe that it's highly likely that they had an, any number of paths that went right through Oakmont, right through Verona, are they marked? Are they remembered? No. We definitely believe that the Allegheny was their superhighway. Wouldn't you love to know? I, I would anyway. How many American Indians went up and down the Allegheny? Looking at Oakmont, looking at Verona, looking at Parnassus, and saying, man, that's beautiful country. I always say to people, we love living here. Why wouldn't the Indians? They lived under the same full moon that set over the Allegheny foothills that we do. And right down along Plum Creek, I drove down there a month ago, they have a mound of dirt because there's construction down there now. But Gary was uh, my authority on this, that there was an Indian burial mound near the mouth of Plum Creek and one at the bottom of Delaware Avenue. And let's use some common sense. They didn't embalm. They didn't have other modes of transportation. They buried their people near where they lived. So I truly believe that there were Indians who lived here where we live today. And you don't have to take my word for it, Brady, Kre Brady Kreitzer in his book, Fort Pitt, A Frontier History, he says there were many, many Indian villages along the Allegheny, and you will find no evidence for them. They lived very simply. They impacted the environment too. It's a myth to think they didn't, but they sure didn't leave an environmental footprint the way we do. And so, from my reading, you know, you zero in where you want. These are some of the positive takeaways that I think are part of the American Indian heritage and our heritage now. Because we all live here together. There are 53,000 people in the state of Pennsylvania who in the, I believe it was the 2010 census, claim some Indian heritage. 53,000. Why didn't you hear about them? Because when Tecumseh lost and the Battle of Fallen Timbers happened, nobody who was left in Pennsylvania wanted to say I was an Indian. Wasn't safe. Like Peter Chartier, many of them were half Indian, half European. And so Chuck Earl Jack told everybody he was Croatian and Polish. And I didn't mention that I was also Shawnee or Iroquois, or Delaware, or Mingo, because it just wasn't safe. And so like the beautiful oak, Mayor Fessemeyer, and who would dispute our mayor, tells me that this is one of the oldest oak trees in Oakmont. It's over on College Avenue, right across from the mayor's house. Isn't that convenient? <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if that's a plant, do you think? But you know, that, that's America. That's Oakmont and that's America. And no matter how we cut it, folks, whether you want to say this is the British and this is the French and go on and on, that right there, that's the American Indians. James Wilson, in a book called The Earth Shall Weep, says that there's not a thinking American who when he or she puts their head, his or her head on their pillow at night, doesn't realize this is the Indian's land.
And so I just want to end with this reflection. The spirits of these chiefs and braves still roam this valley from their graves. If one has the eyes to see, we spot them on the Allegheny. Manifest destiny claim this land of these nations, tribes, and clans. We recognize their rightful claims, their blood, the Allegheny stains. In the morn of the river's mist, lips of sunshine on waters kissed. Their spirit shadows move along in this their home where they belong. These Allegheny spirits walk, their memory our conscience stalks. When our heads rest upon our pillow, we hear their songs by the weeping willows. Their nations rise here once again from tragic tales of toil and pain, living among us to this day, ancestors on this land shall stay. Thank you very much.